So Super. That's the nine. Okay, good evening, everyone. Whilst we wait for people to other people to join, just make sure everyone's connection is okay. Um, if you could type your name and your unit into the chat function, and then we can record your attendance on this webinar. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, and then we'll go for our introduction. So just your name and your unit in the chat function. Okay, I'll give a little introduction about me. So my name is Catherine. I am the Chief Instructor of the Sea Cadet Training Centre Caledonia up in Scotland. And I'm joined by my volunteer colleague, Michelle Webb. And we are just going to be here for safeguarding purposes and just to help facilitate this webinar. And we're also joined, as you can see, by Conrad Manning. Okay, and he is going to give you a lecture on naval architecture and career options that you might be interested in in that field. So I will pass over to you, Conrad, and you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and then start our lecture. Super, thanks. Um, let's see if this... Right, uh, is that changing? Yes. Cool. So yeah, awesome. Uh, th thanks for the introduction. It's, uh, it's great to be here and um, to talk in front of all of you guys uh, who are all sea cadets. Um, my, my background is quite varied. I've kind of gone from w being raised internationally to coming to the south coast of the UK and studying at university and now putting actually putting my degree to use as a naval architect. So a couple of things, just what naval architecture actually is, um, how I've come about to, to take this this role, uh, what naval architecture actually is, um, along with a couple of cool projects that uh, I've used that degree for and uh, what, what my job has allowed me to do. A couple of things about maybe where the future might end up uh, and perhaps a couple of high things that uh, as, as I think back, it might come back with. So if you just Google the definition of naval architecture, it's uh, it's just the activity or profession of designing ships. Uh, but I think it's a much more involved role. Uh, it, it covers so much more than just some, that simple one line. It uh, it covers everything really, from stability to hydrodynamics to structural to all the stuff that goes actually in the boat. So you're looking at anchoring systems, you're looking at um, accommodation or, um, or or powering and over the years it's kind of both the method as well as the analysis has has changed massively so as you can see on the left um, when, when they first started designing boats it was either uh, well, it was originally it was just passed down through through the through generations talking about these are the things that we did here's what we learned uh, as well as looking back at historical boats that they produced. And then they started bringing in things like um, the abacus as a calculator, and then log um, slide rules. Calculators are now what kind of where, where, where we are, where the computers are taking a massive uh, amount of the work that it, uh, it involves. And that also ties up with a lot of the, the, the vessel design going from something that needed many, many men uh, to, to, op to operate and they're usually made of wood to now f full high-tech performance carbon fiber where the boat actually doesn't spend very much time in the water as you might have seen for the recent America's Cup. So a bit about my background. Um, I'm a, I was born and raised out in, in Asia and my parents moved out there um, when they basically left university and uh, it was a, it's, the water is a heck of a lot warmer than it is over here. So it meant that when you learn to sail, it uh, was definitely much, much warmer. And so when you capsized, it kind of didn't matter too much um, because you could very quickly jump back in, warm up and uh, carry on sailing. That kind of stuck with me for a number of years and uh, took it from, from racing optimists to um, lasers very briefly and then stepping up into uh, a lot 
larger boats such as uh, the Amoka 60, which they use on the uh, the One Day Globe, which has happened recently, uh, and as and a couple of smaller ones like the Figaro, which um, sailed around the UK um, in 2015, which was on on this bright pink boat, um, and it was just the two of us, this myself and the owner, um, when we basically started on the back end of a hurricane, and most, if not nearly nearly 50 percent of the fleet had to retire in the first two days and um, just because the weather was was so rigorous uh, and then up around the top near Michael Flugger the storm came back in and uh, that was quite a quite an adventure then but half, half, when I came to the UK um, I came over for A levels and um, because I was based up in London it meant that I couldn't actually get much time uh, out sailing, so I took up rowing, uh, which is kind of meant that I could sort of work on uh, still being on the water this, with uh, what was available there. Around that time, sort of the age of 14, I kind of I, I sat around the dining room table with my parents and declared quite confidently and that I wanted to A, sail around the world and B, to design boats. It, it 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 meant that the GCSE choices were were made much much easier, um, and thankfully tied into what my strong suits were. So I so picking um, triple science, maths, and uh, a couple of other um, subjects, um, and 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 doing quite well in them meant that the A level choices of maths, physics, chemistry, and design technology um, was was made a lot easier and found that it was quite, quite, went quite well. I did drop chemistry for my AS level, um, but that was just simply because then I could focus on um, maths and physics and get the required grades to get to university. I found it, the, 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 the careers team at school, um, they found it actually quite difficult to, to advise me because at that point it was uh, quite, I was quite set in exactly what I was doing. Um, I wanted to go to Southampton University to study, study naval architecture, um, but they were quite adamant to to look at other options. So it, it kind of opened a few do uh, opened my eyes to different universities where I could actually go and study those sorts of things. But and, and that process of actually looking at okay, what do these under the universities look like? What what can they what can they offer? Um, it meant that. I was definitely sure that I wanted to go to Southampton and uh, and study there. I enjoyed this picture because uh, this was when I was uh, uh, training, uh, what was it, trialling for the uh, Artemis Offshore Academy and this was probably uh, uh, day two having slept for probably about two hours uh, and trying to put a winch back together and um, it was a lot messier and uh, a lot more um, expletives ut uttered than, uh, than usual uh, but that was just because <laughs> it was quite easy to forget what you were doing um, with so little sleep. So I went to university, um, I went to Southampton Uni in the end I got I got the required grades and they, they, they let me in um, and, I, and, the and the course was called Ship Science um, with Advanced Materials. It uh, it was it does require a lot of hours of lectures uh, we were kind of working off about 32 hours a week in the first two years but the beauty of kind of the engineering sec um engineering university is a lot of a lot of the courses are combined together so you would be in massive lecture halls with chemical with um mechanical with aerospace with acoustic um, so you're learning a lot of the similar things, so it meant that you can move across different areas quite easily. Um, so you, you don't, you're not necessarily set in what you're doing, um, particularly in the uh, in the later years when you kind of get that much deeper experience to actually what what it involves. Um, one of the one of our one one of the guys in, on the same year as us, um, they she moved from aerospace into ship science. Um, naval architecture because um, she found that what we were doing was a heck of a lot cooler than uh, what they were doing in aerospace. 
around that time, uh, I, I trialled for the um, Artemis Academy um, to be part of the British solo sailing team. And um, it kind of at this point, it made me realise that the, eng the engineering and finishing my degree was was more important than the sailing side of things. Um, and kind of that's what that's 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 the route that I continued down and meant that after four years, I graduated with a with a master's um, in in ship science or naval architecture. My first job straight out of university, um, I, I kind of told myself actually, um, I'm not going to grow up. I'm going to go in and have a have all the fun that I can possibly have and uh, go and experience what it's like to go sailing. Um, I, was, I was quite quite fortunate. I went from leaving university to, to going out into the Far East and, and, and having a lot of fun out there uh, until two weeks before a lot of racing started and basically the start of the racing season. Uh, I, I injured my injured myself, and that kind of wrote off a lot of uh, a, a few months where I needed a operation and, and all the re rehabilitation. But it meant that I could then come back here and and start on 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 this boat here, which is an Orca sixty, like I was saying earlier, which they race in. This this one actually raced in the two thousand eight Monday Globe uh, with the British sailor on board. Um, they didn't make it all the way around due to due to some issues. Um, but I worked on board as a, as a second mate um, or first mate, it depends what, how you actually look at it. Uh, but there was only three of us, the skipper who did all the driving because it was uh, worth a fair bob in, on the insurance and myself and another guy who basically between the three of us, we made sure that she was always ready to go sailing. Uh, any damage was, uh, was repaired and all the maintenance was, was, was kept up to date. It also did kind of give a better ex sort of hands-on experience to actually, well, what are the things you need to be looking at um, when designing boats so that it makes it a lot more useful? Because uh, when you're trying to repair something, having that access is, is, is certainly key. Um, and, and actually being, doing that hands-on um, gave it a great experience. But I kind of put this in to show you that it's not necessarily a, a a, a linear path that you have to take to to become a, a naval architect or, or or to be or, or any job to be fair um i think i, I read recently that uh, i think it's Djokovic, he, he start when he when he first started out he played so many different sports and it took him years to actually get into into tennis um so you, you don't actually you don't have to go straight into in, into the career that you actually end up loving because uh, those different experiences can add to your to your knowledge bank uh, which might make you more valuable to 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 the to the role uh, so i've kind of split down into sort of a different into a plot in, of uh, the, the various things that we actually do at, at co yacht design where i work um, we're we're world renowned in the the performance side of things that we do with that we work on so a lot of we, we the boss's experience was based on performance boats, um, one held predominantly um, being part of multiple America's Cups. Um, but we've kind of worked on everything from uh, submarines to um, large sailing cast brands to small um, monohull sailing boats. And a lot, a lot of the stuff is kind of, you can take from different projects um, and, and kind of inform other other sides of things, which is is certainly um, makes a lot life a lot easier when you can take the design for a fifty foot sailing cat and uh, simply scale it, so you get something that might potentially work on a on a on a seventy two foot sailing cat. Um, but to go into a little bit more detail, uh, I kind of split the the primary um, areas of my role perhaps at uh, at Co Yacht Design. First one is probably the most obvious, uh, aerodynamics. Uh, this is kind of, originally it was, you put a, uh, a, a model sail into a wind tunnel to measure the forces um, and you put, put it in in different 
geometry, different setups, and uh, take the calculations from that and, and, and basically use empirical numbers um, to where it is now where you can plug it into a supercomputer. We, we, we use one on the Amazon cluster, um, which basically pumps through hundreds and thousands of different equations to basically work out the, the forces on the sales generate. Uh, so that we can then work out actually what the sails deliver to, to power the boat. This is kind of progressing more and more. Um, so uh, sail designers have kind of developed this much further so they can actually iterate through different designs on, of, of sails so they can actually so that they can work out what the optimal shape, the, 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 the optimal trim uh, and the uh, to, for, for each point of sale uh, so that when, when they're talking with owners, um, they can actually give them a whole host of information, um, almost a, a, a sale by numbers book of this is how you actually get the most out of your boat um, through your set or, or how to get the most out of the sales. It is kind of blurring the lines between um, sailing and, and computer controlled because um, you could in theory plug those those numbers into a, in, into the computer program and the, the boat would would trim itself um, that's kind of where where things have managed to get to where the computer simulations are seriously good um, and can actually re recreate real life the other side of sort of leading on from that one is is actually the the rules and regulations um, work that we that we do um, we've, we have been working with a, a couple of handicap rules uh, where you take the sale measurements as well as the hull measurements uh, and you can work out basically a factor to add on to the elapsed time of the boat so that the, each, each boat can be, um, be raised fairly. Uh, I should probably put fairly in, a, in, in, in quotation marks because it's always um, a rough representation of actually how well the boat does um, but this has kind of given us a great understanding of okay how can you create a set of uh, uh, equations essentially that when you input partic particular boat parameters you can actually calculate how fast that boat should be going and have it simple enough where you can start with a simple a, a small set of, of, of measurements and cover a very very wide range of boats from classic yachts all the way up to um, to, 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 to full full out and out racing yachts. Um, we're even starting to look at foiling as well, but that's a, that's that's kind of a different kettle of fish, and uh, certainly not very easy to to to, to account for. Uh, that sort of stuff is for foils and that side of things. That 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 is accounted up through um, more fluid dynamics analysis and um, but this time you kind of just change the material uh, the material that where the object is running through um, which works quite well for things that stick underneath the surface but when you actually start looking at hulls you then have the interaction between the water and the air which is where we kept arguing that uh, naval naval architecture is definitely the hardest discipline in engineering because you're not just playing with things that uh, move you're also playing with two different fluids but again this this cfd um, side of things the hydrodynamic analysis that's come on leaps and bounds where originally there was a man who towed a flat panel a flat wooden plate through the waters up in uh, the lake district to work out oh, okay here's a representation between shape roughness and resistance um, and that kind of research has been going on and on and on. So that now, again, we can put any geometry into a computer simulation and work out what the resistance that that hull generates, as well as the sh how it reacts in, in waves as, and um, what sort of pressures and effects come out of, of sailing the boat. Uh, we've recently did a project where we took a 63 foot power catamaran and put it in a computer simulation. We could plot um, a, a lovely video of the boat going through sort of, I think she was three meter swells as if she was in um, 
the Pacific Ocean and you, and we, we gave the owner that video of what their boat should look like as it goes through all those waves, uh, which he was quite pleased with um, and kind of gave us a bit more reason to, to reduce the speed because uh, the pressures ended up being quite high. To counteract a lot of those pressures, we, we again use um, another computer software um, called FEA, which stands for Finite Element Analysis. And that's essentially a, 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 a computer program that runs thousands, if not millions of equations where it calculates the load on a particular element. So for example, um, a beam or uh, a, a, between two points and, and iterates throughout the whole vessel, just tran uh, translating the loads through to where the, the, the item is held, so the constraints, um, so that you can work out a whole myriad of different things um, from stresses to strains to deflections to um, pressures to, well, I can look at it now, I've got a, a, a I've been running uh, this, this evening a, a simulation of a keel on a 50 foot sailing yacht um, and they found that the the that, that it was that the salt water was attacking the frame that this keel was attached to and we're looking at different different methods of repairing this that comes out with a much stronger system uh, a much stronger solution uh, which would then significantly extend the life um, of, of the boat and this F FEA, uh, the, the, this program basically means that we can put the, the 3D geometry of, of the structure and the keel into the boat, uh, into the, in, into the, on, onto the, onto the software, put different constraints and uh, holding it on the side, much like it is in a boat, and then applying a load as if the, the, the whole boat had been knocked over on its side and um, you can see, okay, here are the hot spots of where, where stresses and uh, the stresses are. Uh, in the aluminium and we can, know, we can then know okay well, either we need to reinforce this area or we need to change where the load paths are going through so it's a seriously powerful tool and is something that we use quite often the last one is kind of where things get quite uh, quite technical um, it's called it's called neural networking and it's, it's one of the things that um, we're kind of leading at where I work so this this takes lo lots and lots of different data points um, and, and tries to find a pattern amongst it. So for example, you've, here there's uh, 17 different parameters that they're working off. And each of those has a comparison to something else. Um, so, for example, if, if it was a linear, if you take two things you're trying to compare against, so for example, boat length and boat speed, it, you could very simply compare how different boats' length compares to their speed, and you get a pretty straightforward linear um, uh, linear relationship. But then, if you started adding on things like beam, draft, sail area, mast height boat weight and started adding those particular things in, you could you then start to get seriously complicated, which is where this neural network comes in, where um, it basically works it out for you. So it's a, it's a method of machine learning um, and has allowed us to basically find those solutions for those um, uh, handicap rules off the back of the analysis with the CFD, computational fluid dynamics, um, and the aerodynamics analysis uh, to come up with better solutions. So that's kind of the, the real nitty gritty. And um, I imagine you guys have gotten slightly confused with all of that, which I don't blame you at all. Um, it, it was four years of uh, university stuff that I had to trawl through as well as uh, four years, well, five years now learning on the job. Um, to actually get my head around at least a small part of all of these things. Um, but that's something that I think engineering has, it, it makes it so much more accessible because you can actually start at a much lower level and learn those particular things on the job. 
So you don't have to have gone into uh, to university. Um, you, you can learn through um, apprenticeships or just starting starting a job uh, out of out of school and seeing if someone will take you on. So a few things that this has kind of led to. Um, I I I. <laughs> I go right I do a few of these events where we run either either workshops where we where we build um, gutter boats this one was in, in Portsmouth where we had the use of a workshop so we could shape foam much easier than um, in some of the other workshops where all we had was a was a file um, but it's great fun where you make a lot of mess and I'm sure um, that you guys either have or, or will be doing um, a, a gutter boat race in the future, because uh, it's something that's quite something quite that's quite simple to do, but does actually teach you a, a lot about uh, boat design, so things like stability and resistance, um, which can be taken from those tiny little boats all the way up to big cruise liners and uh, cargo ships. It's also meant that uh, <laughs> I've worked on a few slightly odd activities. Um, this one here, I'd, uh, I'd give, you, give you all the points if you can work out what that actually is. Um, and it's, a, it's reconstituted milk cartons that have been shredded down uh, and then formed with a lot of heat and a lot of pressure to create a panel. And the whole point of those panels is to create a paddleboard uh, to ultimately paddle around the Isle of Wight before the global pandemic put a uh, scup into that. Um, but here you can kind of see the testing that we've, we've, we, we did to try and work out how we're going to join the panels. Um, and kind of between my experience through actual engineering and, and knowing about uh, structures and gluing points and all those sorts of things uh, combined with the practical experience of, of the guys who I'm, I'm working with to create it. Um, we've finally found through a lot of testing uh, a, a method of, of joining them to, to joining joining panels together so that will hopefully if I put my fi if finger, fingers crossed uh, be coming out once we once we're, once we're released from lockdown. But it's also kind of led to a, a myriad of other things that, um, that not necessarily say, um, naval architecture related, uh, but say sailing side of things when you're out on the water, you can kind of un use that experience to optimize and improve how the, uh, the boat sails so that the owners are much happier because you usually end up winning a few more races. And the future itself, um, I think a lot more it will be looking at um, this this buzzword of multidisciplinary design optimization. Uh, so it's kind of bringing in a lot of fluid structure interaction. So what what it says on the tin, where how structure or geometry interacts with the liquid, the salt water usually, um, which then leads into um, giving more realistic or real life. Uh, load cases, which then means you can actually engineer the um, the the hull or the platform or the a submarine to the to those particular loads, um, and then with the amount of data and information that's that's generated, you can then use um, a lot more of AI or machine learning to create a better understanding of actually how uh, these things in work together um, so that the the factors of safety that people have to put on at the moment because uh, you don't know exactly what it's going to see uh, can be reduced more and more and more and um, just as a, as, a, as a slight example if you use the rule for the the iso rule for designing a a, a rudder uh, if you follow that rule exactly compared to what we are able to do through experience and knowledge, you're looking at about a 50% weight saving, which on a racing boat, you're talking big cha big changes. Uh, the second one is, is a lot of green greenification. Um, 
So now whether that's through the use of sails on big container vessels, and that's something that's that's being pushed massively at the moment. And it's one of the projects that we've that we've worked on, um, or in materials. So um, looking at kind of things that are based on rocks. Um, I can't remember the, na the name of the, the fiber off the top of my head, but by using that particular fiber, it then makes it a lot easier to recycle it, um, which then cuts down the material um, wasted, which then cuts down the greenhouse gases used to produce that materials, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that it makes the whole industry much more um, environmentally friendly, which is something it's perhaps not so much at the moment. And then dynamic optimization. Um, I've kind of put that in because um, that's what a lot of people are, are adding to, as buzzwords to their to their to their webinars and, and uh, their lectures um, and not really explaining what it is. But I, if I was to hazard a guess, it would be um, combining computer learned values of loads and safety um, to solutions uh, so that what you produce is even better. And to look at things that are better, um, kind of, it requires a lot of looking back in time as, as, as to what you learned. And um, I kind of put a few ideas of maybe the things that I would have appreciated someone telling me uh, when I was, say, leaving school, um, starting school, leaving school, starting university, um, so that I would be more prepared than what I am at the moment. Um, the first one is, paying more attention into learning how to code um, that's definitely the where things are going more and more so if if, it, if you can treat it like a, a, a second or, th or third or fourth language um, and be able to talk fluently uh, talk uh, type fluently in it um, it definitely gives you a, a particular step up compared to um, your colleagues or, or competitors um, and it is something that definitely I, I wish I'd paid more attention on. Uh, the second one is to actually learn the subject matter than uh, rather than actually studying purely for an exam. Um, I've sort of three years in, I've completely forgotten most of the stuff that I learned at university. And uh, recently we had a concept design that uh, required literally going back to the notes that I took in first year university, uh, which is in a folder about that thick. And leafing through each all all of my notes just to work out actually what's going on here and how can you actually implement that and get the get the right answer. Um, and I know that when I was in my first year, I perhaps spent a little bit more time cramming for an exam rather than actually learning the subject material, so that it was um, second nature rather than uh, rote learned. Um, the third one is probably something that's. I'm, I'm, I'm still learning um, and is always going to be the case, uh, but it's finding the things that you are particularly interested in and taking that, but not to forget the things that you perhaps aren't sure about or, or you'd not, you don't necessarily know about because um, there are things that you might not even be aware of that might, that, that might be even more exciting or cool or better paid or, or, or whatever your measure of success or happiness is. Um, so keeping a, a, a wide eye out there for, for those different opportunities. Uh, four goes without saying, um, spending a lot of time in engineering, having a good knowledge and a good grasp of maths and physics concepts definitely makes life a lot easier because then you can create your own um, uh, relationships between forces and structures and loads and all that sort of thing so that it, it's much quicker and you can get through designs and um, analyze things much to a, to a, to a, to a better extent uh, and quicker. Um, so that's, that's definitely something that I perhaps would spend more time on. And then lastly, um, number five is something that I'm definitely working uh, definitely working on every single day and that's that, that's um 
build it, building a network. Um, so get reaching out to people who you know or, or recently met, or someone maybe your parents know or family friends, just to get their get their advice, their opinions, their life experiences, um, or to to work out where you want to go, or perhaps looking at a different way of okay, you might want to start somewhere um, at a particular company to get experience and actually understand what they're doing because um, that actual hands-on um, role definitely teaches you a lot more than going to school or, or, or asking, them, asking them about it because uh, you actually get that first-hand experience. So, yeah, having that, getting just putting, your, putting yourself out there and, and, and talking to people is, is something that's, I'm finding is, is definitely paying off massively because you can bounce ideas off many other people and, and, and get a variety of answers that give you more information. So that's kind of a bit of a, a, a whirlwind tour of kind of my background of how I've gone from um, gone through school to university and now uh, a role as a naval architect. Um, as well as some of the hobbies with, um, that I have with sailing and rowing and, um, and perhaps a few, a few things that I've learned that perhaps you might find valuable in the future. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you so much for that. That is very interesting. We do have a few questions, but if any of you do have other questions, if you pop them into the Q&A, um, we will start that just now. Okay, so we have seven questions so far. Um, one that's asking, what grades did you achieve in order to go to uni and study this? Um, so I picked... Um, Naval, so actually, it's I, I, I picked going to Southampton uh, to study ship science and um, because that's what I wanted to do. It also turned out that I needed uh, only a, a, b compared to if I wanted to do mechanical engineering, uh, which you needed three a's. But it's definitely always changing what grades you need, uh, and that de kind of depends on how many applicants they have and all that sort of stuff um so it's worth just checking out the the university um where you contemplate studying at um or or having a look for the actual for, for the degree and work out which universities offer it and then see what um a levels you need um but generally um if you want to do engineering it's maths and physics and then a, one of one of another of choice and you'd probably be looking at either three a's um or an, maybe an A star in there um, as well. Thank you so much, that's amazing. Um, how did you get involved in sailing in Mocha 60s and sailing around the world? I will probably start that one and say I haven't yet sailed around the world. That is something that um, I hope to do in the future. Um, the only thing stopping me is a lot of money and a boat, um, two quite fundamental things to sailing around the world. Um, but getting involved with a mocha, that kind of leads on, leads from um, my point number five um, of, of getting out, meeting people, because um, this came about through sailing two-handed um, in my second and third year of university um, and also trialling for that um, British offshore solo group because um, so that the people who were running this boat, the, the Amoka 60, knew who I was, knew what my experience was, saw, saw how saw the standard of my experience um, and then offered me the role. Um, it, it definitely pays tribute to it. It's, it's definitely a lot of who you know rather than what you know, but it certainly does help to know a lot. Cool, yeah, totally agree. Um, so we have someone who also wants to study ship science at Southampton as well, like yourself, but he's asking, was it easy to find a job in the industry after? I suppose that relates back to the getting in touch with people as well, but. Um, oh, that's, it's, it's, a, it's a tough question. Um, Simplest answer is yes. Um, 
the probably the more um, real or honest answer um, is what do you want to do? Um, so I was kind I, I kind of didn't want to go into the a small cog in a big machine um, with a graduate graduate internship thing. Um, I can't remember what it's called, but basically you go in there, you work, you work there for two years and they give you all the box ticking exercises and you end up with a job uh, or you move. Um, I, I kind of went into sailing and then went into a, a small boutique firm. Um, but yeah, again, it, it's, it's getting, if, if, if you were at university and, and had the opportunity, say at Christmas or East, there's no Easter, or, or during summer to actually go and do an internship at a company, um then then those opportunities are even bigger um but definitely ship science at southampton gives you a massive step up to anyone who's at glasgow or uh, newcastle not that i'm biased in any way particularly southampton solent you definitely don't want to go to southampton solent <laughs> i am joking though <laughs> okay um do you we have someone who's specifically in, really interested in hydrofoil design and foiling boats. Um, he's asking how much of that do you see as a naval architect or is this more towards another field? Um, it's entirely naval architecture. Um, well, yeah, you'd say it was naval architecture, um, but the aerospace guys do want to try and get involved. Um, but it's so for example, well, there's a lot more boats that are using hydrofoil technology at the moment. Um, so we're, we're, we've got one on our, one of our designs, um, one of the consultancy project, consultancy work that we do has another on that design. Um, but it's, it's definitely looking more at the hydrodynamic side, um, even though it is looking more at a wing, um, because it is that interaction between the air and the water, um, particularly uh, as the boat comes out, comes out of the water, because mm. it's quite easy for air to get drawn down the the support um, or the strut or the the shape of the foil, um, which is definitely bad, because um, then you lose all the lift that's generated and the boat falls down and it. Oh well, yeah, awesome. Um, so. Do you have any knowledge of places that are asking specifically on the south coast, but anywhere in the UK, because we have cadets all over, um, that do boat engineering apprenticeships or apprenticeships oh, in your field? Do you have any? Everywhere. Um, ah, um, do you mind just asking that one again? I might have misunderstood that. Oh, sorry. Um, do you have any knowledge of specific places or companies that offer apprenticeships they're asking specifically for the south coast but so um, apprenticeships in your field uh, yes um so there are a lot um but it's you then kind of need to work out okay do you want to be doing the engineering side like the engines and working on engines or do you want to be doing a design apprentice, apprenticeship, which is another thing uh, and would be a different set of companies? Um, or is it like a more of a pure apprenticeship doing building stuff um, like boat building and that sort of thing, which is, again, a different set of companies? Um, the best thing to do um, is... Uh, there's a couple of things, but the easiest perhaps one to do is have a look at British Marine. Um, uh, they have a find, a find a job or find an apprenticeship or find a college, something like that on their website. Um, if I remember, um, I'll, I'll send it through to, to, to you guys at the, at the Scouts, um, the link. But it's quite easy to find and it's basically just a list of different colleges where, where you can study particular different things and there's also companies which um, who offer that sort of stuff. That's fantastic if you could um, yeah we'll certainly advertise that on our many many forms of communication. Um, so someone's asking what is the largest boat or ship you have been involved in the design of? 
Um, or is there a specific boat that we might know of that you are involved with? No, um, they're predominantly they are <laughs> privately owned people with lots and lots of money. Um, so probably the biggest one that I've actually designing and that will be a, that will be built is there's potentially a 72 foot sailing catamaran that will be launched in probably about two years time um which will be the biggest one that i've worked on um but the one that's been launched most recently is a 60 foot sailing cat cool um we have another question of just like how much of your time is divided between like CFD simulations and stress testing compared to the actual designing and production of the boats? It's, um, how much of time is divided between CFD simulations, stress testing compared to actual design and production? Um, oh, well, yeah, that's a question we've got. Yeah, it's, 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 it's because because the 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 CFD simulations and FEA and all that sort of stuff is part of the actual design of the boat. Um, yeah. So I I don't actually spend much time on say the handicap rating side of things, um, and I don't personally do much of the CFD because we've got two chaps who are significantly better than I am at it. Um, but. So, so, so if you take if you take the the, the whole life cycle of designing a boat, um, you, it it works out as kind of a spiral um, where you just go round and round and round until you come up with a design that actually works and gets built. And basically, you start with, okay, what what do I want it to do? And as you go round, you you basically work out what the weights are, how it's going to be powered, the shape, and then it, you step you step through it. Um, so you you each each goes into different different levels um so it's a difficult question to answer because it's all part of the same thing yeah 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 definitely um cool. um we do have a final question um what sort of salaries are naval architects looking at in their career um it's a good question. Um, the best way of looking that one up um, is if you have a Google of uh, Marine Resources Career Salary Survey, etc., um, and that will break down um, the salary for not just naval architecture, um, but the whole marine industry, uh, and it's also looking at uh, all parts of the UK from Scotland to Wales to England, um, sorry, and that will probably give you quite a good idea of, of salaries. Um, but you shouldn't necessarily focus straight on salary because um, I, I, I do a lot and probably work more than what I'm paid. Um, but those opportunities that I'm getting, um, such as leading leading the pro leading particular projects, I wouldn't have been able to get mm -hmm. if I was at a big corporate um where i'd be paid probably slightly more mm -hmm. um but i would just be some dog body just doing stuff <laughs> um still be cool yeah. but perhaps not as cool what i do at the moment yeah it's finding that balance between enjoying it and making the money isn't it and also we have another just interesting question here um what is the most common boat design that we would see and also what is the rarest boat design? Uh, as in one that I've <laughs> done or one that uh, exists? Um, um, I think one that exists or if there's... So... Pretty general. Yeah, one that exists. Yeah. Um, probably the most, most common will be um, bulk carriers. Um, now, that's probably quite a broad spectrum um of of kind of things i mean you could you could drill down into minute detail and there's probably sort of 20 or so of each design out there um but definitely the most common will be, will be commercial commercial vessels 
um, and the rarest will be sort of one-off custom builds. Um, so you're looking at mega yachts, super yachts, racing boats. Um, I mean, the America's Cup, each one of those boats are entirely unique. Um, and the mockers, again, they're, they're, they're all entirely unique. Um, so you kind of you kind of look at okay where's the where, where's the the massive amount of money going and that's probably where the unique custom boats are and the commercial side of things is, is where there's lots of them well fabulous thank you so much for that and thank you so much for joining us tonight and i think that's most of the questions that we have um so yeah thank you for your time that was very interesting hopefully we've got some cadets interested in naval architecture and designing the boats you know they've hopefully all had a chance to sail them now so <laughs> yeah well you're, mo you're, you're more than you welcome that. thanks for joining us yeah you're, you're more than welcome I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed myself um if if anyone has got any questions that they've not been able to ask or i've not answered um then you guys have got my details and, and, I, and I honestly don't mind if you guys just fire anything through. I'm, I'm happy to help. Thank you very much. Yep. So if you do have any questions, guys, just get in touch with your unit or us and we can help facilitate that and answer any questions that you have. But thank you very much, everyone. And we'll see you for another webinar soon, hopefully. But thank you for joining us and good luck with boat designing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Well, hopefully I'll be able to clock off now as uh, it's been done. Thank you. Yeah, well, have a good night and thank you very much. Goodbye. Super. Cheers.